Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think we're at 2.30. Uh, glad you've decided to join us. We are, uh, this session is uh, building a strong ministry team, best practices. And so this is not where you intended to be. We'll give you 30 seconds to leave and we won't be offended. If you leave after 30 seconds, we'll be highly offended. So I hope, I hope you'll uh, stay with us. This, uh, we intend this to be a... a pretty informal, casual uh, conversation, uh, some best practices that um, we have realized in our own ministries, but every ministry is unique, and uh, we hope to hear from you and to have good dialogue about what works, uh, what you've seen work, what maybe you have seen not work, uh, and so I hope that this will be uh, a time to for all of us to share together. The three of us on the panel, I'll let John and Carol introduce themselves. Uh, we come from very uh, different backgrounds in terms of uh, our ministries, where we are, where we've been, what we're doing, uh, and things like that. So hopefully uh, you have a good cross-section of varying ministry aspects, and hopefully it will be, uh, hopefully everybody will get something uh, out of this. So um, I'll start introducing myself. My name is Nathan Edwards. Um, I have officially been a minister of music now for a sum total of three years, so I'm still very new into my ministry. I grew up in a uh, music minister's home, so I have been around this for my really entire life. So um, I've seen some things on that side of it, and now I'm learning some things the hard way. Uh, is what I'll, what I'll say. I've served churches in, in Memphis, and I'm now in northeast Alabama, called uh, in a town called Gadsden, Alabama. And so um, I'm excited to, to be here. This is my second Alleluia conference, and so uh, I really enjoy what this is. I am in a bivocational setting, so I this is my, I call it my hobby, but it is a part-time uh, I say part-time, it's a bivocational role. Um, when Dr. Bradley asked me about, about doing this, I said, well, does it challenge, does it threaten the credibility of a panel like this? You know, to have somebody that's relatively new in their ministry and in a bivocational setting. And he said, well, uh, that's the way some of our industry is going. So some of you may be in a similar uh, setting. So hopefully uh, there's some ways that we can, we can learn from each other. Uh, in that regard. As a full-time job, I manage a consulting firm offering uh, financial and administrative services to churches and nonprofits. So if you find yourself in a church that needs financial or administrative help, you can see me after this. We can talk in, in a different capacity. But um, <clears throat> one thing that uh, I will say, a few things that I have um, come to learn uh, in my very short but but hopefully effective ministry is um, uh, just a few things. What what this session is is you know we we've come with some prepared remarks and then we'll we'll open it up for, for discussion. But there are really uh, four things that I have I've come to learn and as we as we share together, I think it will be helpful if. As you talk, ask questions, you know, as we engage, it will help if you tell us who you are, where you're from, kind of how your ministry team is structured, and then that will give us a sense of what we're dealing with. So, uh, as I mentioned, I'm in a bivocational role. Uh, my ministry team, I kind of categorize in two parts. There's my worship team and then a program team. So, my worship team consists of an organist, a pianist, uh, a choir, we average around 30 uh, on Sundays, and then a sound and AV, uh, two people that kind of run that ministry. That's our worship team. Then our program team consists of our children's choir teachers, our preschool choir teachers, and then we have uh, some handbell uh, groups and ensembles as part of my ministry. So that's that's where I come from. That's That's the perspective that I have in my current uh, ministry. So a couple of things that I would like to share and then I'll, I'll turn it over to these two is, um, well I'll tell you what, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and then we'll come back to that. I've been talking long enough. John, why don't you go next? 
Hi, I'm John McDaniel, and i um, really honored to be able to speak here. Uh, I've probably been to, I don't know, six or seven Alleluia conferences over the years, um, and I'm always blessed by being here. Um, I've served in full-time ministry for 16 years, and I've been in worship ministries for over 20 years now, and I've been uh, serving in Texas, California, Minnesota, back to California, and now I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I have served in a variety of settings, uh, medium-sized churches, large church settings with multiple staff under me. Uh, in my last church before First Baptist Santa Fe, uh, I had seven staff working for me. Three of those were full-time. Um, and a pretty large program. In that church, I grew it from 70 to over 250 in five years in the whole ministry. So, um, and I tell you what, there's no right answer for how you get there. Um, but as far as leadership is concerned, there are several principles that I try to live my life by. And one of those is, is to have a plan. Uh, if you don't have a plan, you're not going to have good leadership. Uh, you've got to show your team, no matter how small or large it is, uh, that you've got a way to get there. Uh, second thing is, is to be approachable and, uh, and listen to people. Uh, and, and of course, you're all coming at it from different, different areas. I don't know how long you've been in your churches. Um, in my current setting, I've only been there since February, and so I'm having to do a lot of listening right now. Uh, but you've got to be approachable, and you've got to listen. And the third is mentors. Um, if, if you can have somebody you can trust, that you can talk to, uh, especially someone who's not in your church, if it can be someone who's not in your church, that's, in my opinion, the healthiest way to go because you need to be able to be transparent and sometimes share hard things with, with people. But mentors is really important. I learned the value that uh, when I was in Minnesota, that church, when I went there, we were doing five services on the weekend. And then we went multi-site and we started uh, doing six services on the weekend. And I was overseeing the staff and leading worship and I just, didn't know what to do in that setting. So I went to my pastor and said, hey, I need some help here. I need somebody who's got a background in business. And he said, well, that's my job. I said, well, but you went to school for theology and I need somebody who went to school for business. So I got two mentors out of that. One was a self-made businessman and the other was um, a retired executive from 3M who uh, also had her doctorate in leadership. And that's the person who whenever I'm in the weeds and I don't know exactly what to do, I call her up and she gives me great business advice. And then the last thing I would say is you've got to have fun. If you don't laugh in your ministry, you, you know, people will follow. If you're having a good time, they'll follow you. Uh, but if everything is always intense and it's business, 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 then you're not balancing it out. So those are the four things. Uh, have a plan, be approachable, uh, have mentors, and have fun and laugh. Carol. I'm Carol Holt, and I'm from Austin. Um, I'm currently uh, at a Lutheran church. Well, I've been in a Lutheran church all my life. My father was a Lutheran pastor. Um, in my current position, I have been there for 20 years now, and I've been in music ministry for 40 years. These guys are young. <laughs> um, my position is called Director of Worship and Music, so um, I do a lot of worship-related work, almost as much or more than I do music work in my setting. Um, I do have uh, we have some paid music staff besides myself. We have an organist and a keyboard and, and, a, and an AV person. Then I have volunteer leaders under me also, and I work closely with the, our worship ministry team leaders 
our directors of children's choirs who are volunteers, our altar guild coordinator, our acolyte coordinator, our prayer writer coordinator, all these people that do parts of worship, then I um, oversee all of that as, as well. And of course, I work closely with the pastor, but um, mostly what the pastor does is preach and I do everything else. <laughs> um, <laughs> We and it, I would say it's a it's a fair, it's a medium sized congregation as Lutheran churches go, and uh, we have choir handbells and children's choirs as I said, and or small uh, various ensembles or uh, a small orchestra that plays at special occasions, and we have a praise band which I also coordinate. Um, so in reflecting on building strong ministry, I have three things. I'm a four. <laughs> uh, first, I would say relationships, and, and these men have both uh, alluded to that as well. Um, know your people. Know who, get to know these people that are part of your ministry. Um, know how they respond to suggestions, to criticism, to change, and help them, and, because each person is different, and you have to relate to people on different levels, in different ways. Are they motivated and, and self-starter kind of people, or do they need a lot of guidance and need to be pulled along? Are they chiefs or are they followers? So if you can identify who are going to be your leaders, you can um, help your people who are in leadership positions grow. And uh, if you can be aware of do these people, um, how they respond to you and uh, what their motivations are. So relationships is really important. Respect would be the second thing I would say. Um, allow your leaders and your general people uh, in your choirs to make suggestions that they know will be considered, that you won't, aren't going to dismiss out of hand, that you're going to give them reasonable answers uh, for questions or for if you decide not to use their ideas. Respect their time, start on time, end on time, don't waste time, and realize that all of these people are volunteers. Most of the people that we work with are volunteers. And so they have conflicts that are, come up. Um, don't put guilt trips on people. Just be respectful of people as, uh, as they are, as wherever they are in their lives. And the third thing I would say is to be the expert. No, John talked about planning and uh, having a plan, and I would say know your stuff. Um, be trustworthy and reliable and responsible so people know they can count on you to know what you're talking about and to get done what needs to be done. Um, but also gather together people that have complementary skills to yours. So you can't be an expert in everything. Um, so gather around you people that are creative in a different way. I, I'm, not, I'm not visually, uh, artistically creative. So on the liturgical arts team, I really need people that can visualize things that are artistic and they come up, they, you know, they have beautiful ideas that I would never think of and certainly not know how to pull off. So um, gather around you people that are uh, different, have different skills than yours but can complement yours and make them feel needed and important and um, valued. Awesome. All right, so I'll, I'll come back to mine. We seem to be uh, running through lists of things, and, and they're, they're pretty similar. Um, John talked about, about trust, and Carol did as well. You know, my, my list of four, uh, find quality people that you trust and let them do their work. Uh, as Carol said, we, we can't do it all, and we shouldn't try to do it all. Neither have I experienced it to be effective when you put somebody in a position that, oh, well, this is the person that's always done that, and you can't rely on it, you can't trust that. Um, if, you can't, if you feel like you have to look over their shoulder and micromanage, I think that that's going to become problematic for both of you, or you know, for whoever that is. So identify quality people that have the skill set for which you're looking, and then let them do it. 
Um, the second thing is acknowledge your dependence on them and the importance that they play in the ministry. Um, it is important to be the leader, to be the expert, to be the one with the plan, but you rely on these people. I rely on my people. If my organist comes ill-prepared, that's going to be a problem for me. Uh, if my choir is not ready to go, that, that's an issue. So we're mutually dependent upon each other. It's incumbent upon us as, as the minister or whatever our title is to prepare them to be ready and to give them the tools they need to be successful. Um, sorry, I'm from Alabama, so you'll see some Nick Saban talk coming <laughs> to this. You need to give them the tools they need to be successful. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, little, little side note there. But it is important. We, we can't ask our people to come ready to do something if we haven't equipped them to do that effectively. Um, so, I, And I think it's important for us to acknowledge with the people that we do depend on them. They are important, not just to our ministry, but the ministry of the church. So to affirm them in that. Uh, the third thing, and this is something that I've learned in, in many settings, mostly in my business background, but it is tell people why you're doing something. Tell them why you're asking them to do something this way. You know, um, as, as I you know, look forward and, and select anthems for our choir, you know, I'll say, okay, well, the pastor is preaching on this text, and here's why this anthem is thematically consistent. Here's why we're doing this. And I find that people... Uh, feel a sense of ownership and engagement when they understand this is not just the packet of my 10 favorite anthems or whatever it is or these are not you know we're not singing these hymns on Sunday because they're my four favorite it's because of this reason and that reason and um, I, I find that people really will get behind you if they understand the purpose so I think that 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 is something that has been important um, not just in my music ministry, but, but with any team that I've, that I've led. The final thing is, I find it is important to both publicly and privately affirm your team. Um, there are going to be times when, or at least there have been times in my ministry, when some things have happened that I haven't wanted to fully affirm. And I, my personality is more not perfectionist, but just, you know, I've asked you to do something, why isn't it done the way that I want to? But it's, that, that has been less effective than giving them public and private affirmation. Because what they do is very supportive of what we're trying to accomplish. So I think, I think those four things, um, really the, the third one, tell them why you're asked, why you're doing certain things has really been one that I think has been has been important in my in my ministry. So with that, we've the three of us have been talking enough and I think I think we want to hear from from you. What questions do you have? What what situations have you encountered? What are some things are you dealing with something now that we can talk about uh, in this room? And so um, at this point, does anybody have something they would like to offer for the group? See people collaborating over here. Somebody's got a story to tell. <laughs> All right, well, I'll get, I'll get the ball rolling then. Uh, one of the things that we talk about, regardless of the size of your ministry team, it's important to communicate with them. So, um, I'd like to talk. I'd, I'd like to get some thoughts, Carol. I may, I may put this to you to start our discussion. How how do you communicate formally, informally? How do you communicate with your various teams? Well, a lot of it depends on who the people, are, who it is. 
because nowadays people have a lot of uh, different platforms that they use for communication, and it's a lot of generational, not entirely. Um, in in my, for me, emailing is the most common. That's how I do most communications. Um, just for general disbursement of information, I would email. We have an e. Of an e, of e blast an email newsletter each week. I put stuff in that. We have a website that's really not very helpful, but there's a few things on there that I put on there. Um, we also have announcement slides in worship, so um, since I control those, a lot of them have to do with stuff I want out there. Um, so that kind of general uh, information, and you know, there's kind of a uh, in the in the business world, I think there's kind of acknowledgement that people have to see information eight times before they you know really get it or pay attention or whatever. So you can't do too many, I don't think, too much that way. If I'm going to ask for something specific of someone, um, a lot of people will respond to email. A lot of people won't. Asking in person is always the best, whatever age. And texting is more and more, I find, a way to get a response from people. Again, whatever age, my generation on down. If I can text people, I'm going to get a response right away, much more than if I email people. Um, and, and when I do recruiting, I do make use of, um, I'm going to be just real specific here. I use a doodle calendar a lot of times when I'm trying to set up a meeting or a rehearsal of just a few people. Um, I, People will, uh, it's an online tool where you can put all these possible times and have everybody fill them in and then pick the one which has the most people can attend um, all at once. Um, what is that called? Doodle. It's, it's, a, it's free. You just doodle.com or whatever. D-O-O-D-L-E. -O -O -E. There's probably a lot of other pieces of software similar to that. Um, and then I would say, in just in general, about general communication, try to be really clear, be sure your details are clear, um, and follow up immediately on any complaints or disagreements or questions. Uh, we kind of have a rule in our office that an email needs to be responded to within 24 hours, at least to say, I got it, I'm thinking about it, whatever. Um, and also meet regularly if you have team leaders, so um, so you can be sure you're on the same page. And it can be uh, a Google Chats platform, or it can be a set up meeting, you know, whatever works. But just so that you're so that you're regularly touching base with the people that you are relying on, as much as they are relying on you. Okay. So. Um, Along the same lines as what uh, Carol said, uh, follow up immediately. Uh, I have a pastor, dear friend of mine, who gave me advice uh, before I even went to seminary, and he said, uh, if there's one piece of advice I could give you, it's to keep short accounts with people. And so I have, that is stuck with me. It's like, uh, especially if there's conflict, I try to make sure I resolve it quickly. And one of the things I have found is that if there's conflict, don't do it through email. Mm -hmm. Stay away from email. If someone, if someone uh, is, uh, they're, they're in disagreement with you or they have a conflict with you and they email you, I find it's best just to pick up the phone and give them a call. Right then and there, if you can. Uh, if it's your day off, Wait, then do it the very next day. But get it done because you don't want it to last. Uh, you want to make it right. And, you know, I would say 99% of the time, it's a miscommunication uh, if there's conflict. So um, I would just say that's a great rule to follow. Um, I use Planning Center to communicate with large groups of people. Um, if I need to get something out to everybody, it's a quick and easy tool, so it must be a lot like Doodle in that aspect. But the other a lot more complete planning center is a lot more. But the other thing that I have found by using planning center 
is that if I get done with a rehearsal and something didn't quite gel with a particular voice part, I can go do a sectional, record it on my phone, and download it to Planning Center. And I can tell them if, you know, we get to the end of the rehearsal, say, Altos, I know it wasn't working for you. Uh, I'm going to post something to Planning Center tonight, and then it'll be there for you. And so I post it to there. It gives them a, re a rehearsal right then and there. They can go practice before Sunday. So I find that to be a real helpful tool in communicating uh, music. Um, yeah. Yes. Just in regard to that, the training center, is it the groups module that you do that on? Or what, which module? I do it on the worship planning module. Oh, just like on the worship, the services. Yeah, I do it in the, well, I'll attach it to a song. Okay. So if I, so like if you have several things attached there, I'll make sure if it's for the altos, I'll put alto sectional. And that way they know, oh, that's what I'm supposed to listen to. Because sometimes you'll have eight attachments to a song. Yeah. You know. Okay. Um, you know, text, text, you're right, texting, you get a quicker response that way. Um, but in person, absolutely, I agree with you. In person is the best way to communicate. I find that I get some feedback. Uh, unfortunately, my wife is in my choir, but she doesn't even read my emails. They're too long, <laughs> is what she says. So that's some pretty immediate feedback, like, I'm not going to read this. So she's very supportive. She just has a, a short attention span when it comes to my talking. Um, I think that's true just in worship and music playing, but we'll see, I guess, as time goes on. Um, some other people seem to have chimed in. How many people use Planning Center? What what other what other forms from some others of communication do you have a a choir newsletter? Do you do you print something on Wednesday nights when you rehearse and put it with them? Some somebody else do, do all of that, but I, I found these days that since information is so available to everyone, they will access it when they choose to access it when they're available and when they want to. Not necessarily when you hand it to them. Not necessarily when you tell them to but when they're good and ready. And so I've gone to good great lengths to have a website that always has calendars, it always has song lists, it always has song recordings, it has every possible thing. My choir knows better than to come to me and say, I didn't know about this. I didn't know about that. I've never heard it, I've never seen it. So uh, you put it all out there so that they can hit it, and who knows when they're gonna hit it and get it. But that's really worked well. And tell us who you are, where you are, kind of what your I'm, team I'm Stuart Condra. I'm uh, in South Carolina. Uh, I have a team that is uh, mostly part-time, a full-time assistant, orchestra director, children's choir coordinator, uh, full-time AV, uh, some others I can't remember right now, but uh, four services on Sundays. So. That's a lot of service. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I lead two, and, and that's that's the other one. Contemporary, full time contemporary lady leads the other two. So. Uh, anybody getting into the Facebook group that to communicate? We do that a little bit. For parents. Okay. For the church. For parents. <laughs> oh yeah. For the church and for the children's ministries, we do. But you're right, teenagers. And young uh, adults aren't using Facebook much, but I would say millennials still use it fairly much. People my age use it a lot, except for me. It's how, it's how we became cool, and now we need to figure out how to Snapchat our stuff, <laughs> Instagram it, right? Mm -hmm. Which I don't have any of, and, and not planning to get. I don't think. But anyway, what what's your experience and use and how, how do you use this? Well, I, work, I work for a Methodist church on Sunday mornings and my choir averages about 12 people. So I find that Facebook is a pretty easy way to communicate with people. I, we don't have our own choir page. I've worked at some churches that do. I just post it on the church's general Facebook page and um, people will sometimes share it even if they aren't in the choir. Um, and there are one or two people who do not use Facebook, 
they don't even have computers. So I have everybody's phone number and I will call them to make sure. But usually by then, someone else has already called them and said we're not having choir rehearsal tonight or whatever I need to say. So that, that just works for me in my church. Um, yeah. My church uses Remind. Um, I'm Pam Valdez from San Antonio. And I'm in a, a, well, there's small churches and then there's small churches, but I'm in a small church that's not really, really, really small. Um, but I'm in kind of a weird situation because um, I've been a member of this church for about 20 years, and three different times have been interim, choir director, sometimes worship leader, sometimes not, and now I'm like the real deal. So I've moved into this position where I'm now leading people that I was on a team with. And so there have been some growing pains, if you will. I also, I just recently retired from a career as an elementary music teacher. And so this part-time position at church is my only job now. And so I have joined the team at church in a different way. I'm able to be there during the day and go to staff meetings and know what's going on and stuff. Whereas for the last five years, I've basically been you know, teaching full time and leading the choir at handbell. So now I still am doing that and I'm also leading the worship team and overseeing the children's um, choir stuff and um, whatever else the pastor has up his sleeve that he hasn't told me about yet. <laughs> so, um, so I have had to deal with some not wanting to let me actually be the leader issues that I'm trying to work through by, you know, a lot of grace, a lot of, a lot of love over that, but can be very tricky. But anyway, communication-wise, um, because I'm a teacher, I have a bulletin board. <laughs> I have old school. But we also, the pastor uses Remind, and I have group, Remind groups, so I can communicate just with my handbell group or just with my choir or with everybody in it. So, anyway. Congratulations on your promotion. Thank you. <laughs> it seems like it's super and awesome. That, that's right. <laughs> promotion and other things. You, you've communicated a lot of messages in what you've, in what you've said. Um, anybody else in a similar situation where you're now leading people with whom you were previously working? Or another situation where you've come into a deep tradition and there are ways of doing things that you should abide by. Anybody come through that? Everybody. <laughs> no? <laughs> well, I kind of uh, ascended uh, the ranks just by attrition. Because if you stay long enough, everybody else leaves. Congratulations Thanks. to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how it came to right. me as well. <laughs> um, I'm Russell Farnell. I'm the, the music minister at First Presbyterian in Arlington. Um, and when I first uh, first started, I was interim for a year. And uh, then the choir and the pastor asked me to, uh, to come on full time. And that's when I started getting into the sort of the committee life of the, of the church. And was told the um, the organist owns the organ, so you don't touch that, you don't mess with any of that stuff. And we, this committee does all this stuff, so you just sit there and you know smile. And uh, that was 10, 10 years ago or so. And so those people have kind of retired off of those committees and stuff. And now everybody depends on me <laughs> for sort of the the knowledge that. Uh, you know, has, has fallen off, but um, I just through um, trying to to and the pastor has left and or all that kind of stuff. So I'm sort of senior uh, senior staff now, um, but that has uh, really made me think how how do I how do I build you know uh, trust with people because there wasn't that kind of trust before, and it was it's all because of people that came before me, um, you know, and, and the patterns that were there, and just trying to establish new new patterns, and um, 
and uh, that just really comes from being consistent and making sure that that people feel comfortable um, with my relationship with them and so investing in them and uh, just so happens that I uh, offered um, uh, a, a new organist position uh, yeah, last night um, so I'm I'm hoping to uh, to make that that team uh, which we have a I have an, a music associate who's assistant organist in our church we do organ and piano a little bit of piano mostly organ and um, uh, two identical traditional services uh, one chapel and one sanctuary and um, so we have just a lot of uh, uh, I guess expectations for the for the organist because that's traditionally where the like I said where the power was vested um, and um, it's just kind of come around to where um, people are asking me things now so I need to to make sure that this new organist is is ready um, to uh, you know to, to to make this make this transition and make this change so that that they can um, be successful, and, and uh, so I just need to, need to be available and supportive. That's kind of what, how I see my role uh, for that person. Sounds like it's um, one of those things about that working as a team, as opposed to being in, in it by yourself. Um, we all, as Nathan said, rely on other people, um, and and in in your case, for instance. You're bringing in a new person. I, would, I just would encourage that situation to be seen from the start as a team effort. We're both here to make worship happen. We're both here to do, you know, make the best kind of worship that we can in this place. And um, you know, this person, you're, when you have new people come on, it's kind of exciting because you can help mold them. And but then they also can bring a lot of new ideas that um, that you know may be really great. I, I think he was alluding there to change and how change happens in your situations, how your change happens in churches, and lead and how to lead that change. Um, it's helpful to be somewhere a long a long time because yeah, you do have attrition. I'm the longest serving staff member in, in my situation now, and um, but at the same time, you can't stay in your on, you know in the same pattern over 20 years you've got to be constantly even over five years you have to be constantly changing or looking towards um, what the next steps are how is worship changing in general so kudos to all of you for being here because that's the kind of thing that we we learn here is what are the trends and what do other people do and and um, what are new things that we can do to enrich our worship Quick, quick show of hands. How many people have been in your position for 10 years or more? Wow. Uh, uh, five to 10. Less than five. Okay, that's fair. Um, and and as, you, as you brought up, you know, this, and Carol, you did the, the, the pattern of change, the need for change. Um, John, I know that was something that, as, as we plan, as we talked about this, that's something that you specifically wanted to, to mention. So, so um, one of the things that I found helpful in generating change, it's always hard for some people, and some people just won't. That's, <laughs> that's the reality of it. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, just make sure you smile a lot when you talk to those people <laughs> that don't want the change. Uh, and, and do listen, because they might be right a little bit. Um, no, but, I, <laughs> but what I found to be extremely helpful when you're trying to generate that change, and you have an opportunity now with a new staff member coming on board, is to get your team together. If you don't already have a mission statement for your ministry, let that team craft a mission statement together. 
uh, it will be a wonderful process you go through. It usually takes anywhere from four to six months to get that mission statement. But once you do, and then you launch that mission statement, uh, it permeates the whole ministry. And if you have all of your leadership in, on board with that, then all of a sudden, everybody is saying the same language. Uh, when I was at Fair Oaks Presbyterian, we did this process. And when I left there, and I bet you, you could still go up to somebody today and say, Watch our, what is our mission statement? And they would say something like, is it about serving and leading something about the worshiping community to glorify God? They would be able to, to rattle off those things. Everything funnels back into that. So I would say if you really want to generate change, don't do it by yourself. You need to have people on your team that you do it together. And that way you own it. And that way you can start generating that change. And then you need to have some vision. You need to, to have some short-term goals and some long-term goals, but it needs to feed back into, okay, where are we headed? Where are we going? Where do we want to be? Where do we want to be in five years? What do we want it to look like in five years? Let that team wrestle with what we want it to look like. Um, and then all of a sudden, you're going to start generating some synergy there because, and some people will get on board with that change. And the people that aren't on board with the change, that never will be, it's okay. Just let it go. <laughs> and But you'll have the majority of people on board with you. And you might have to look for people that are visionaries to help you. Like get somebody in to come in or, or even a member of your group or somebody to come in that knows how to envision. It's very hard for the average person to say, what do we want to have in five years from now? Some people can do that well and can help you. Uh, and, and I would add on to what I said about the people that refuse to change or don't want to do it. Um, there are a couple options. You can maybe redirect their interest and find something else, some other place for them to be leaders that's not directly related to what it is you're trying to change that they don't like. Um, put them in a different position, give them some other responsibility so they still feel valued, but aren't right there in, you know, in your way, as it were. And also offer people a chance to bow out if they don't agree or don't want to be a part of this change. Sometimes, in, at least in churches I've been in, people get on a committee. Okay, I'm on the worship committee, and they never get off. It's like there's no term limits. <laughs> but maybe they really are tired of it, kind of, you know, and really just feel like they, you know, they really have to keep doing it because that's what they've always done. You can offer them some way out of that or some, you know, would you like to step back at this point um, or would you like to do something else? Anybody else been a part of a, a major change which you would consider something like that. Uh, I'm Susan Hoover. I'm Minister of Music at First Baptist Church in Kingsport, Tennessee. And our church, many, many years ago, probably 20, 25 years ago, went from um, offering just traditional um, service. We added a contemporary, and we are a downtown church that um, is very traditionally driven. We have um, other churches where it's situated on a circle. And so we have our um, Presbyterian church right beside us, the biggest one in town, and then our um, Methodist church right beside us, all very, very steeped in tradition. And so we started, um, we changed first by going to two traditional services. And then we um, got changed again by having our um, early traditional service become our contemporary service. And so... Um, a lot of change, uh, churches change very slowly <laughs> and very and our church very deliberately mm. um, and so um, one of the best suggestions that I can maybe just throw out is is just um, something that we heard all the time is that we stretch the rubber band but we don't break it and so we do a lot of stretching at our church 
and um, we've had um, our contemporary service. We don't have worship wars at our church or anything because our staff deliberately um, I do all the music that goes into traditional service and my music associate does all the um, groups that go into the contemporary service, but we are both at both services every Sunday. All of our staff attends both services every Sunday. And so the congregation sees us all working together and um, that's a huge part of success. Another thing about um, just being in a church for a long time and building a team is is you've got to always have at the forefront of your mind that you have got to set others up for success. Um, that is just one of my number one goals is I work really hard to make sure that that my people that work with me look successful because you're not just you're reflecting the whole entire church and bringing excellence to God, and you just want to give your best efforts. And the, the verse that says, I want to offer anything that costs me nothing. We, we are here to work and to be very vigilant about helping others grow and learn. And, and um, I love um, seeing my people succeed and do well in what they're doing just because it lets our whole entire church know that we've got a really strong team. And so um, our church, um, our contemporary service um, has grown so much that we are hiring right now. <laughs> Anybody that's interested in a full-time contemporary worship leading position, um, our church is hiring our first full-time contemporary worship leader. So um, if you'd like to move to the gorgeous mountains of um, Northeast Tennessee and be an awesome church, um, we have um, that position available now. So um, anyway, but... Also, something else I'll just throw out on the table, look to see who is influencing your pastor and who's, who, who your pastor listens to, because if you're really wanting to do something, um, in our church, if our pastor's not on board, you go nowhere. I mean, the, the idea or whatever, it just um, dies. <laughs> so look to see who's influencing your pastor and and you can kind of um, talk to some of the influencers and um, hopefully get some, some feedback that way of you know, how should I approach this or, or something else. And then learn how your pastor communicates too. Um, our pastor um, communicates with very, very short little emails, you know, if, text or email. If I want to answer immediately, no more than three lines. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how he works. And so, you know. So just learn how your um, other people um, communicate, especially people that are above you, and um, so for what it's worth. But. A bunch of people laughed when you said, you know, know, know who your pastor listens to. Um, does anybody include their pastor on their ministry team? What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry. And, and as, as how, whatever your, your team is, is it a worship planning team? Is it a, you know, do you include your pastor in the leadership for your, your music programming? <laughs> you know, is this, obviously your pastor is going to be somebody that is very influential in the overall mission of the church and the program of the church. But is this somebody that you engage very regularly <coughs> as you make decisions about these things. So I meet Absolutely. weekly with our pastor. Okay. We have yes. a set time. Uh, and mostly I come prepared with ideas, suggestions. Um, if we're going to have a theme that I, if I, I look at the elections ahead of time, we follow electionary and, and I, I see a theme occurring. So I'll come with ideas and suggestions, and we talk about those together. Um, I've been very fortunate in my ministry to always be working with a pastor that I have gotten along with well. Um, so I know that's not always the case, but um, I think part of that is mutual respect. And so if I come and I know what I'm talking about, then they are very willing to listen. But at the same time, then that, that the pastor may say, have another idea about something, and then I'll will change course from what I originally said or thought about. Um, that being said, so I meet with the pastor, but that, but in my situation, the pastor does not meet with our worship teams. Um, I lead those meetings. 
and basically report back to him or her. We're going to call process and we're going to call her, but we haven't had a female pastor before. So. I also meet with my pastor weekly, uh, and much like you, I go in with a plan, but sometimes we change it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't say this early on, but I wear two hats. Um, I'm the pastor of worship and the pastor of education, so uh, I'm juggling those in my ministry. It, does anybody else here wear more than one hat? Good. All right. So. We, we can talk after this is over if you need to, but it's, uh, but then I also oversee uh, some teams that I have responsibility for, but I also try to make sure that I communicate and communicate and have an open door policy for my pastor. He can walk in anytime if the door's open. <laughs> And, uh, and we'll just have conversation because we want to keep that going all the time. I mean, I don't know, I don't know, if, even in a large church setting, um, I love having that open door policy because it, it helps keep that relationship going and it also keeps, uh, it keeps your, if you want to say your oil uh, full, <laughs> You want to keep that. You want to keep that full, so you can have. Because really, I think the most important relationship you have is your pastor. So uh, you want to have that relationship with them, and you want to have the relationship to be able to disagree. That's okay. Well, the other, one of, one of the things I have learned though is that if you disagree on something, and your pastor makes a decision that you don't agree with. At the end of the day, you've got to let the pastor make that decision and support the decision of the pastor. Uh, usually it's not a make it or break it issue. Uh, so I've learned to let that one go over the years. <laughs> Can we change a little bit and sure. talk, y'all talk about your best recruiting um, practices? So, um, because that's, I think that's a challenge for all of us, um, and so I'd just like to hear, how do you get people in the door as far as um, to be a part of, of what you're doing? One-on-ones. I have to say, relationships, talking to people, whenever you hear that someone's interested, you get on that phone or you find them and you talk to them. Uh, trying to recruit from the front on a Sunday morning, you're not gonna get very many people. So that's, I find just one-on-ones. And then trying to meet people where they are. Um, in my last church, our choir wasn't growing. And it's like, what are we gonna do? We can't get any young people into this. So what we did is we started a specialized group. We found that a lot of our moms just couldn't come every week. It, it was just not going to work for their schedule. And so we started, uh, we would have monthly rehearsals. It was easier for their schedule, and then we rotated them in for worship leadership. So we started building on that, and all of a sudden we had 20 on in this group. And whenever we would do big pieces, then we would just put everybody together. And so you try to, you start working, try to figure out, okay, how can I meet the people where they are? Because don't expect that the way you're doing it now is going to necessarily work for this generation right now. They're going too many directions for you to do that. So try to, I even, I even moved rehearsals to my own home so I could have a closer relationship with them, not on the church campus. So get creative with it. Well, I would agree. I mean, we don't have a strong choral tradition at our church. And it's a struggle to have a choir. Mm -hmm. But we do have a lot of quartets. Cool. There are four people that will sing. So I recruit by the, by the month. I have a you know, group of probably 25, 30 singers that will rotate in. But they're not willing to commit to a weekly rehearsal. We have a lot of young families. And 
they're not, and then like, then again, when we do a big, big thing, then we can get them all to come together one way or another. But then I don't, if we're going to do like when we have lessons and carols, I don't say, okay, these are the rehearsals, there's five of them, you know. No, I say, okay, there's ten options here, come to the five that you can make which is a lot of time for a lot of extra time, but then you'll get more people. Um, take, yes, and face-to-face and -face conversations is the, and the best. Take the extra rehearsal. With, if, if, if you've got to meet separately with another individual and you really want them on that team, take the extra time and go ahead and have that extra rehearsal. Yeah. Just do it. One thing I might say is let the people that are on your team recruit for you. Yeah. You know, let let them say this is this is something that I've done, I've committed to this, or I've become a part of this group, and here's what it's giving to me. You know, it's not just a, it's not just taking from me. Here's how it gives to me, and so that's that's one thing that I ask. I have, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, I have a, a choir of about thirty, and I've got section leaders, and that's one thing I ask them to do is, you know. Try to, if you can invite people, if you can agree to meet them someplace, get them in the room for one rehearsal, then feel, you know, let them decide, is this giving to me? But let those people go to work for you is something that I've, I've found successful. Anything else? We have just a couple more minutes. Any? I was just going to say, we, tr we started something years ago that, that has been very successful. Uh, so we call it different things, but for lack of a better name, we call it Visit the Choir Night. And it's not only open to singers, but it's open to anyone in the church who, hey, I just wondered what the choir does. And we have just never seen it and thought I'd pop in. So we make each of our choir members bring somebody that night. Everybody has to bring somebody in. It's an open invitation to anyone else. And we've gained quite a few folks who come in to see you know, not only what a musical group it is, but what a family it is, and how much fun we have, and how the belonging sense. And, and I just think a lot of people who haven't been in choir, I'm going to talk in choirs here specifically, but you can apply it to anything, and have not been in that environment before, don't realize how great it is, and what a good thing it would be for them, and maybe I should try this sometime. And so uh, it's sort of an open one night, make it a real easy rehearsal, real friendly rehearsal, end early, have our freshness, you know, do everything to make it as simple as possible for them. But uh, that's probably the best, best thing we've had over the years. I did that too at my church. We had a meet the choir night. We, we've been doing a tradition of Wednesday night suppers, and so the pastor actually let me speak at that supper. We ate together. And then he let me give a little talk about singing in the church. And everybody who wanted to come could come. And at the end, we had our choir rehearsal, and we recruited some new people. That's great. Yeah. Some of your choir members have to tell, okay, we're going to have visitors. <laughs> <laughs> well, not to yeah. You might have to sit in a different chair. Well, I say, be on your best behavior. <laughs> Tenor section, for the love, we have visitors. <laughs> Presentation of our music ministry. <laughs> People don't know. That's why, and, and I know we're right up against time. But one thing that, that I try to do in, in worship is people don't know what all goes on inside a church, and so if if they can be informed of, you know, it's not just we show up on Sunday morning and you know we put on a robe and this is what we do. If they know what. What a Wednesday night experience can be like. I mean, that can be a meaningful part of a person's week. And so just, you know, just that education can can be helpful. And they may never join the choir, but all of a sudden they become a cheerleader for yes. you and promote you to other That's people. exactly right. That's exactly right. I know we're running out of time, but I have one more thing I think is hugely important. Um, and I have just made this something that I think is the most important thing you could do in leadership. That's a big statement to make. Uh, be prepared and be ahead of time. If you, if you show up and you're not prepared, they know it and they, they won't follow you. But if you show up prepared and you're there ahead of time, always be ahead of time. Uh, 
I find those two things hugely valuable. People will follow you if you do those two things. And pray for your people. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's right. Any other questions? I, I appreciate you being with us today and allowing us to share. I appreciate the dialogue. And if you have any other questions, please see any of the three of us or converse outside. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.